perhaps the most important operational item in the field of reciprocating compressors is proper lubrication. To provide proper lubrication involves a certain amount of intelligent care, knowledge and attention. Proper lubrication includes first selection of a high quality lubricant suited for the particular service conditions of the machine. Then cleanliness in storage and dispensing. And finally, and perhaps the most important point, the application of correct quantities in a manner that permits effective performance. Closely allied to these important factors are maintenance of clean gas into and throughout the compressor and the use of regular procedures for inspecting, cleaning and maintaining mechanical perfection both in the compressor and its accessories. Proper lubrication will lead to reduced wear of sensitive and critical parts of the compressor, avoidance of catastrophic failure and malfunction, increased reliability, reduced cost of system downtime, spare parts and labor for repair, and minimum power consumption. So the question is, how does a lubricating oil work? A lubricating oil is expected to separate rubbing parts, dissipate frictional heat through cooling and heat transfer, flash away entering dirt as well as debris, minimize wear, reduce friction loss and power requirement, reduce gas leakage, protect parts from corrosion, and minimize deposits, just to name a few. In the lubrication of reciprocating compressors, two different groups of requirements must be considered. First, those of the bearings of the driving end, and second, those of the compressor cylinders. In both bearings and cylinders, the lubricating oil must form and maintain strong films that will minimize friction and wear. In cylinders, however, it must render this service with the rate of oil feed kept at a minimum. And in addition, it must protect against rusting and aid in sealing the piston, valves and rod packing against leakage. However, bearings are supplied with large quantities of oil. This oil is used over and over for long periods. This section is designed to provide you with a complete understanding of compressor lubrication. This understanding is a prerequisite for a successful operation and maintenance of your reciprocating compressor. In practically all reciprocating compressors, as the example you can see here, the oil charge for lubrication of bearings is contained in a reservoir in the base of the crankcase, as seen here. Oil from the bearings, cross heads, or any cylinder open to the crankcase drains back to the reservoir by gravity. However, a variety of methods are employed for delivering oil from the reservoir to the lubricated parts. First, we list these methods, then in the next couple of videos, we will see each one of them in detail. These methods include splash lubrication, splash and flood lubrication, and full pressure circulation lubrication system. In the splash lubrication systems, Oil is delivered to lubricated parts entirely by splash. In these reciprocating compressors that use the splash lubrication system, as the one you can see here, a portion or projection from one or more cranks or connecting rods dips into the oil and produces a spray that reaches all internal parts. This is depicted here in this simplified animation. Keep in mind, when the splash method is employed, the level of oil in the reservoir 
should be maintained within predetermined limits in order to prevent either over or under lubrication. Many horizontal compressors, as the example you can see here, use the splash and flood lubrication system for bearing and crosshead lubrication. In this system, oil is elevated from the reservoir and splashed by scoops on the crank counterweights. Some oil is diverted to the bearings and the remainder is thrown into a large pocket over the crosshead, from which a stream of oil flows to the crosshead pin and crosshead bearing surfaces. This is illustrated here in this simplified animation. As you can see from this animation, this lubrication system guarantees an ample oil supply for the crosshead and the bearings. To illustrate the concept of the full pressure circulation lubrication system, we will focus on the lower part of the following vertical reciprocating compressor, namely the crosshead, the crankshaft, and the crankcase. This lower compressor assembly, together with its lubricating system, can be symbolically depicted as follows. So here you can see the crosshead, the crankshaft, and the crankcase. Let's have a closer look at this lubrication system. In our case, this lubricating system includes a positive displacement pump, usually of the gear pump type, an oil cooler, especially for large compressors where large quantities of oil are being circulated, an oil filter, numerous pressure gauges, in addition to oil pressure safety devices, in order to shut the compressor down in the event of oil pressure failure. In this system, oil is drawn up from the crankcase sump through a strainer to the oil pump, as you can see here. The lubricating oil is then forced through the oil filter. From the oil filter, the oil is led under pressure to the crankshaft. The main bearings are lubricated by drilled passages in the main bearing saddles. The oil is forced through drilled passages in the crankshaft, as you can see here, and then to the connecting rod. This lubricates the crank pin bearings, crosshead pin bushing, and the crosshead slide. Once all the components are lubricated, the oil drips back to the reservoir as depicted here. Finally, to finish off this video, keep in mind that compressor crankcases are designed to exclude dust and other contaminants and to prevent oil leakage. All access openings have tight covers. The shafts are effectively sealed. Vents are provided to permit crankcase breathing. When these are equipped with air filters, the entrance of contaminants is minimized. In this video, we're going to talk about the factors that affect the bearing lubrication. Recall, the most important operational item in the field of compressors is proper lubrication. To provide proper lubrication involves a certain amount of knowledge, care, and attention. So, what are the factors that affect bearing lubrication? To put it simply, proper bearing lubrication relies on six factors. First, we list them, then we will discuss each one of them in detail. These factors include 
Fluid Film Lubrication Thin Film Lubrication Oxidation Water Type of Lubricating Oil and the Frequency of Oil Changes Now, in general, the factors such as load, speed, temperature, and the presence of water and other contaminants have a moderate effect on compressor bearing lubrication. Why is that? Because, keep in mind, all lubricated surfaces in compressor crankcases are provided with an excess of lubricating oil. During operation, surfaces are separated by thick oil films that prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact and reduce friction. Under these conditions, the most important property of an oil is its viscosity at the operating temperature. Oils of suitable viscosity will distribute rapidly and evenly to form a film that will resist being squeezed from loaded areas. During operation, fluid oil films exist between bearing surfaces. However, during compressor shutdown, adequate fluid films can no longer be maintained and some metal-to-metal -metal contacts may occur. Under these conditions, and regardless of bearing type, the film strength property of an oil is of increasing importance. An oil having adequate film strength will resist rupture and therefore minimize metal-to-metal -metal contact, friction and wear. In this regard, diester and polyalpha olefin synthetic oils are often compounded for these requirements and should be considered for modern compressor installations. Keep in mind here that only thin films of oil exist at points of frictional contact in anti-friction bearings. So, to minimize metal-to-metal -metal contact and to reduce friction, a lubricating oil having adequate film strength is required. Cooling, cleaning and protection against rusting are also important functions of the lubricating oil and again the oil viscosity should be in a range that provides ready distribution. Now for oxidation, much of the circulating oil in compressor crankcases is broken up into fine spray or mist by splash or oil thrown from rotating parts as it was seen in a previous video. As a result, a large surface of oil is exposed to the oxidizing influence of warm air and oxidation will occur at a rate that depends on the operating temperature and the ability of the oil to resist this chemical change. Oil oxidation is accompanied by a gradual increase in viscosity and eventually by the deposition of insoluble products in the form of gum or sludge. These deposits may accumulate in oil passages and restrict the flow of oil to the bearings. Keep in mind, conditions that promote oxidation in crankcases are mild compared to oxidizing conditions in compressor cylinders. We will see this in detail further ahead. For the next factor, although water may enter the compressor crankcase by condensation from the atmosphere during idle periods, or possibly from leaking jackets as depicted in this example, there is little water present because of the continuous venting of water vapor at crankcase temperatures. Normally, therefore, there is little opportunity for the formation of troublesome emulsions, which could combine with dust and other contaminants to form sludges that would restrict the flow of oil to the lubricated surfaces. A good compressor crankcase oil will nevertheless need adequate water separating ability to resist the formation of harmful emulsions and to permit water to collect at low points where it may be drained off, as seen here.
the type of oil used for the lubrication of bearings and running gear components must, without a doubt, comply with the recommendations of your compressor manufacturer. As a general rule, a good quality non-detergent mineral oil should be used. These lubricants should contain rust and oxidation inhibitors. They should display good anti-foaming qualities. The anti-foaming properties are important in compressors using splash or flood systems. At normal ambient temperatures, the oil should have a minimum viscosity of 200 Seibold seconds at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. This is equivalent to SAE30 or ISO 100 grade lubricant. Actually, it is not desirable to use a detergent type oil. And if for any reason a change is made to an oil with detergent characteristics, the entire oil system must be thoroughly cleaned. Dirt and deposits, which will be loosened by the detergent oil, must be flushed away from the system. From my industrial experience, I can guarantee that it is false economy to use an inferior, low-cost, poor-quality lubricating oil. A poor-quality oil will not guarantee proper lubrication and will not be efficient in preventing metal-to-metal -metal contact or in reducing friction. So, whenever you opt for a poor quality oil, prepare yourself for reduced reliability, increased maintenance cost, and significant loss of production. In some severe cases, the poor quality of the lubricating oil will fail in maintaining a thin film between the moving ports, which will lead to premature wear, failure, and will render the compressor inoperable. So, the savings made on oil will be quickly offset by the downtime and maintenance cost. My advice is to use a lubricating oil that must comply with the recommendations of your compressor manufacturer. Finally, to finish off this video, it is not practical to predefine how often an oil should be changed. The oil will become contaminated with foreign material being held in suspensions as well as moisture due to condensation. Therefore, the time interval for oil changes is governed by the operating and local ambient conditions. Keep in mind that the oil charge will not last indefinitely, and certainly if the compressor is shut down for maintenance, it is a good practice to completely clean the crankcase, change filters, and install new oil at this time. I strongly recommend you to perform periodic oil analysis to determine the optimum change frequencies. This will give you an insight as to when your lubricating oil becomes charged with deposits or becomes oxidized. You can track and analyze the moisture content, the viscosity stability, the total acid number, and the flash point. In fact, Lubricating oil analysis for component wear is an excellent preventive maintenance technique. In contrast to the lubrication of crankcase and bearings, the lubrication system for compressor cylinders and packing must be able to reliably deliver small amounts of oil at higher pressures in order to lubricate the wearing surfaces of cylinders and piston rods. Cylinder and packing lube systems are terminating, or once-through systems. The volume of oil delivered at each point needs to be just enough for proper lubrication. Therefore, the rate of lubrication at each point is critical. Here, over-lubrication must be avoided. Why is that? Because excessive oil volumes can cause fouling of valves, gumming of the packing, and accumulation in the downstream piping system. Because of the higher pressures and low flow rates involved, a pressured header type system is not acceptable.
these systems are positive displacement systems. They must be capable of accurately delivering, monitoring, and protecting the oil flow to each lubrication point. The force feed lubrication system used for cylinder lubrication is actually the most important support system used on reciprocating compressors. Should it fail or not work properly, the compressor unit could be seriously damaged in a short time of operation. Ironically, because of its apparent complexity, the lube system is in many cases the most misunderstood, ignored, neglected, and misused system on the compressor. In the next couple of videos, we will do our best to demystify this important topic. So, watch carefully the next videos, and if you have any question, then feel free to ask us for help in the Q&A section. In the cylinder packing lube system, oil is fed directly to the cylinder walls at one or more points by means of a mechanical force feed lubricator. The oldest and most basic lube system is the box lubricator. Take a look at the following cross-sectional view of a vertical reciprocating compressor. Let's focus on the crankcase. Here, for a reminder, you can see the crankcase frame, the crankshaft, the lubricating pump, which is of the positive displacement type, the lubricator, the oil filter, and the breather. In this arrangement, the pump feeds each point, each with an adjustable stroke, and some side glass to view the adjusted feed rate. The suction stroke of the pump takes oil from the reservoir and discharges it down the line. Box lubricators, as the one you can see here, are driven either from the crankshaft, from another moving part of the machine, or by a separate electric motor. They contain a reservoir for oil and individual pumping elements. A camshaft operates the pumping elements. Now, there are two types of pumping elements used in the box type lubricator system. These are pumps with sight glass and pumps with pressurized supplies. In the next couple of videos, we will see each system in detail. In this video, we will focus our attention on pumps with a side glass that are used to lubricate the cylinders and packing of reciprocating compressors. Now, take a look at the following crankcase example. The lubricating system I'm referring to is located here. Let's have a closer look. Starting our way from top to bottom, this lubricating system includes a positive displacement pump, a side well, an adjustment screw, an oil reservoir, a rocker arm assembly, a suction tube, and a strainer. Here, the positive displacement pump is of the piston type and is made of a cam, a spring, a piston, a supply inlet shut-off ball, and a discharge check valve. Ok, so how does this lubricating system work? To illustrate this, let's watch it in operation. As you can see here, rotation of the lubricator cam actuates the pump rocker arm assembly to operate the pump piston. On the piston downstroke, Spring pressure is exerted on the piston, causing it to follow the cam. As it moves down, a pressure reduction is created between the piston and the check valve, and so the valve closes. The supply inlet shut-off ball 
is then unseated and lubricant is drawn into the piston cylinder from the side well. This creates a vacuum in the airtight side well that causes lubricant from the reservoir to be drawn into the well until pressure is equalized. On the piston upstroke, the oil in the cylinder is injected through the discharge check valve to the compressor injection point, namely the cylinder and the packing. The number of drops seen falling in the sight well is the amount of oil discharged by the pump. Now each pump can be adjusted by means of an external screw. This changes the length of the pump stroke which changes the volume of oil being displaced or in other words changes the pump discharge volume. This is the operation principle of pumps with side glass used in lubricating system to lubricate the cylinder and packing of reciprocating compressors. In this video, we will shift our attention to the second type of lubricating system, that is, pumps with pressurized supply. So let's have a closer look. A pump with a pressurized supply is depicted here. The principle of operation is similar to that of the pump with a side glass that we have seen in the previous video. The only exception here is that the supply of lubricant to the pump is by means of a pressurized supply. You can see here this lubricating system in operation. This lecture is perhaps the most important lecture of the compressor lubrication section. So watch it carefully and if you have any question, then feel free to ask us for help in the Q&A section. First of all, the amount of oil fed to the compressor cylinders should be sufficient enough to provide lubrication and to effectively seal the piston against leakage. Oil feeds above this amount are wasteful, cause oxidation and tend to increase oil carryover to distribution lines. All of the oil fed to the cylinders is subjected to oxidizing conditions. Actually, under heating, even the best quality lubricating oil will oxidize to some extent. Therefore, Feeding more oil than is actually needed results in increasing the amount of oxidation products. Because the highest temperatures are encountered on discharge valves and in discharge passages, and most of the oil fed to the cylinders eventually leaves through the discharge valves, it is here that deposits tend to accumulate. The picture that you can see now is taken from our maintenance shop and shows deposits accumulation on one of our compressor discharge valves. As you can see here, the deposit is severe. Now, to prevent or minimize trouble from deposits, an oil especially suitable for compressor service that permits using very low rates of oil feed should be used. Feed rates for compressor cylinder lubrication are typically shown in drops per minute. However, the principal difficulty with the pumping elements of the box type lubricators, as seen in a previous video, is that the measurement of drops is not reliable. Actually, consumption per 24 hours is the proper way to determine feed rates, because drops vary in size and there is also a variation 
between the specific gravities of the site glass liquid and that of the lubricating oil. Having said that, you can still use the number of drops as an estimate and as a way to obtain a balance between cylinder feeds. The quantity of oil needed to provide ample lubrication for any compressor cylinder can be obtained by using one of the following two equations. These equations are based on 40,000 drops per gallon and lubrication of 600 square feet of swept surface per drop. Here, the drops per minute must be divided between the number of oil feed points to the cylinder and the feed to the rod packing should not be counted. The packing must be considered as a separate cylinder for lubrication purposes. Now, as a rule of thumb, rates of oil feed will fall between the limits shown in the following table. Here, the rates are expressed in drops per minute as a function of the cylinder diameter and discharge pressure. These rates correspond to the total for one cylinder and one packing. As an example, for a 20-inch cylinder discharging compressed gas at 150 psi, the oil feed rate should be between 19 and 24 drops per minute. This quantity of oil will lubricate both the cylinder and the packing. Keep in mind, oil feeds to cylinder bores should never be less than one drop per outlet per minute under any conditions. These data are taken from the Compressed Air and Gas Handbook and are available in PDF format in the downloadable resource section. These rates should be increased for dirty or wet gas conditions and also for the initial running of new compressors. Oil feed rates can also be obtained from this next figure. This figure represents an oil feed chart for compressor cylinders. The recommended oil feed is a function of the cylinder diameter, the piston stroke, and the compressor speed. This chart is provided by the technical department of ExxonMobil. Because it is based on actual plant data of various reciprocating compressors, this chart is without a doubt a valuable and accurate tool to determine appropriate oil feed rates. Now, as an example, let's consider a single cylinder reciprocating compressor with a 20 inch piston, 16 inch stroke, and a rotative speed of 300 rpm. To determine the optimum oil rate for this compressor, using this chart from 20 inches cylinder diameter, read across to the line representing 16 inches stroke, and then down to the 300 rpm line, then across to line representing 10 million square feet per quart of oil. This is an average rate of oil feed. Depending on circumstances, a lesser or greater rate may be chosen. From this point, read up to the consumption scale. The proper consumption in our case is 0.6 quarts per 24-hour day. Now, this chart is also available in PDF format in the downloadable resource section. Now, of course, it is a good thing that we have various tools whether theoretical or based on plant data to assess the rate of oil feed. But a practical and frequently used method, which I personally recommend to determine whether the proper amount of oil is being fed, is to remove the discharge valves from time to time and examine them, as well as all accessible parts of the cylinder, valve passages and discharge pipe. In case of proper lubrication, all surfaces should have a wet appearance and should feel oily to the touch. However, if they are dry or show signs of rusting, 
the rate of oil feed should be increased. On the other hand, if the parts have excessive oil on them, or if oil is lying in pools in the cylinders, then the rate of oil feed should be reduced. Keep in mind, for your own safety, in the operation of air compressors, over lubrication of the cylinders and the subsequent carryover of the excess oil to the downstream piping system causes excessive deposits and the real possibility of explosion or fire. Finally, to finish off this section, keep in mind and always recall that the biggest problem with box lubricator pumps is that they either pump too much oil or no oil at all. They are difficult to adjust and maintain, they often are driven too fast to deliver the required amount of oil, and they cannot provide protected delivery. Any pump can stop without being noticed, causing serious damage to the compressor cylinders, packings, and other components. If very old or subject to dirty oil, the pump piston can be so badly worn in the pump body that it can no longer reliably deliver oil. If the rocker or cam is badly worn, the pump will not operate at its maximum stroke. If the adjusting screw is worn, missing or not assembled or not located correctly on the rocker arm, the pump will pump at maximum stroke and its discharge cannot be cut back. Remember, all reciprocating compressors need a clean, air-free oil supply.